Hi and welcome to today's video. My name is Paul. So this week, this week's a little bit different. Um, the video is going to be a bit longer and it's not, I'm not doing any drawing or painting. Instead, I'm just going to talk about some artists and some paintings and drawings that inspire me, um, that have inspired the sort of art that I'm trying to produce these days. So I guess the goal of the video is a bit of entertainment, maybe a bit of information about some of these artists, and maybe it also uh, inspires some other people to check out some of these artists. I think most of them are quite famous, but there may be somebody that you know, you're not that familiar with. Um, so definitely, if you have a chance and you're interested, you know, look up these people, do a bit of research on their life and what they were trying to do with their art. I've said before, I definitely think um, spending a bit of time researching artists from the past, artists that you like, you admire, uh, it's a rewarding experience, but also an informative experience. You know, rather than reinventing the wheel, we can always learn from what people did in the past and take their ideas, develop them, incorporate them into our own style of painting, things like that. This first painting, of course, usually called Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, or van Gogh if you prefer. V uh, Vincent definitely spent a lot of time reading and studying about art. Um, he was very knowledgeable about the art world and art history. Uh, he was very knowledgeable about many things. He took a, an interest in different things, the natural world, uh, science. He was very interested in astronomy, for example. This painting, he completed this painting while he was staying in the asylum. Um, there's the famous episode in his life where he cut off his ear or part of his ear um, after having a bit of a fallout with Gauguin and other influence as well, consuming far too much alcohol, he not eating properly, he just had a bit of a, a mental and physical breakdown. So it was agreed that he would spend, voluntarily, he would spend some time in an asylum um, to try and build up his strength again and try and help him deal with mental illness that he suffered from. So his brother Theo um, supported him and paid the medical expenses. Originally, Vincent was going to be shipped off to a very large asylum in the city of Marseille. Fortunately, that didn't happen. I say fortunately because if you read a lot of reports and things of asylums from those sort of days back in the 19th century, they, they resemble a kind of torture chamber. Some of the um, so-called treatments were barbaric. But the small asylum where Vincent ended up was run by a very different sort of a doctor. He was much more progressive, uh, much more modern in his way of thinking. And so, for example, he did think, he believed that nature had a, um, a huge calming effect and a very beneficial effect both on your physical and your mental health. So he had uh, some beautiful gardens planted around the asylum and he encouraged the patients to take time and walk through these gardens. He also believed that art and music things could help um, people again with their mental health. So it was agreed that Vincent would have as well as his room for sleeping he would have a small studio that he could use for painting and he would be supplied with um, paint and canvas and so on. And this is one of the paintings that he painted from that small studio looking out the window. He couldn't paint at night because, well in those days of course they didn't have electric lights and things. Uh, and candles and small gas lights. There wasn't enough light really to be able to paint at night. So this painting 
we think, was probably done from memory. He may have spent time in the studio looking out the window at night, uh, sort of pre-dawn sky, but most of it was done from memory and a bit of imagination as well. So that's one of the first things that attracts me to this painting because if you've spent time on this channel, you know that I paint mainly from imagination and memory. I prefer to paint that way. So anyway, Vincent also used that approach for this painting. And we know that he took quite a bit of artistic license with the painting. So we know from, well, we know that Asylum, the view from the window, that small room that he used as a studio, you could see these hills. Um, I forget the name of the hills, but you can see them in a sort of diagonal running from the middle right down to the lower left. And th those are real. And he'd see those hills. But the village that he painted, there was a village, but you couldn't see it from the window of his studio. In fact, the village was in the opposite direction. So Vincent uh, basically took the village and put it into the valley in front of the, his studio. Also the cypress tree, there were cypress trees around the edge of the gardens in the asylum, but they were quite a bit uh, further away. So Vincent's taken just one of those cypress trees and moved it much closer. The church in almost in the sort of center, or bottom center of the, the painting, Again, he's using a bit of artistic license there. The, the village did have a church, but it had a kind of domed roof, not the very sharp uh, sloping roof and not the very pointy steeple that Vincent's added in. So in other words, he's, he's making, he's using a bit of imagination with this painting and he's painting what he wants to paint. And getting back to the idea of using imagination and memory, It's definitely something that, you know, if you've never tried it, I would definitely recommend it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but you know, there's no harm in trying it once. Um, it was actually Gauguin who tried to persuade Vincent to try painting from imagination and memory. Up until then, Vincent had been painting from life. I think something that he picked up probably from the Impressionist painters. Um, he was, Vincent was quite reluctant to do that, but as I say, eventually, maybe just circumstances forced him to, to use this approach to painting. Vincent was never happy with this actual painting. And if he had had more time, uh, he may well have painted over it. We know that he did paint over quite a few of his paintings and that was not uncommon. Um, other artists did that as well. Um, I've done that in the past myself. It's one good thing about oil paint is you can definitely paint over things. Acrylic paint to some extent. When you get into things like um, soft pastels and charcoal, watercolor even, uh, you it's a bit more tricky to paint over. But certainly with oils and acrylic it's possible. During his time in that asylum, Vincent painted at least 150 paintings that we know about. And many of these, like Starry Night, are some of his best known paintings. So as I said at the beginning, fortunately, he didn't get sent off to the large asylum in Marseille. Unfortunately, he remained at this much smaller, more progressive asylum because Otherwise, you know, who knows what might have happened to Vincent. He, his art career would almost certainly have come to an end. And the 150 odd paintings that he painted while in the asylum, um, those would never have existed probably. The second um, painter is also a Dutch painter, but very, very different. And if you look at the sort of drawing and painting that I do, it may be surprising to see that I like this painter because he paints in a style that I've often put down. I'm not a huge fan of this sort of academic style of, 
approach to art that focuses very much on technique and things like that. But I do like paintings by Vermeer. And although it looks very academic and very traditional, Vermeer was actually quite a, a radical painter for his time. So he included lots of techniques that are sometimes more associated with modern art. He included a kind of pointillism. Um, you can see in the foreground on the sort of table, there's some bread. And to give the sort of feeling of the surface texture of that bread, he used a kind of pointillism, little dots of paint built up on top of each other to create a sort of a feeling of the rough sort of crust of the bread. He also used um, patches of bright color like blue um, to suggest shadows and things. And that's something that the Impressionists did uh, much later. He painted wet in wet. I'm not sure if the oil painters use the term wet and wet. I'm not sure. Um, but basically putting wet paint on top of wet paint. He also used um, lots of dry brush techniques and impasto techniques. Basically he was a very accomplished painter and he knew how to use different types of, different ways of applying the paint to create different textures on the canvas and to suggest the different textures um, of the objects that he was painting. This painting, I think very often it's referred to as the milkmaid, um, which is kind of a, a misleading name because sometimes it's also called the kitchen maid, which is a much more accurate description of the painting itself. Vermeer did go through this period of painting mostly sort of working class people, especially women just sort of doing everyday tasks. So in this case, I pouring milk into that sort of pot. Some people have said that this is maybe, she's maybe making a, a kind of bread pudding where they took some bread that was maybe a day or two past its best. It was starting to go a bit stale. So they would cut it up into rough pieces, put it into a pot with milk and maybe some sugar or honey and different spices and, and make a kind of sweet pudding. Some people don't like Vermeer because they think of him as a cheat. So what I mean is there is some evidence to suggest that Vermeer used uh, some sort of device that allowed him to trace the outline of objects, some type of camera obscura, that type of thing, um, which was not uncommon in those days, uh, using artists using that sort of equipment to get an accurate outline of the shapes and things that they were going to uh, paint. But some people say, well, that's cheating. Um, it's uh, an interesting way of looking at art, I suppose. And I'm using the word interesting in a diplomatic way. So as I've said before, I think there are people who admire, they don't admire the creativity in art so much as they admire the, what they perceive as the skill in art. So if they look at something and they think, well, I wouldn't know how to do that. This artist was able to do it. So therefore I admire this artist because they have some sort of skill that I don't have. If they then discover that the artist used some sort of apparatus, like a, some kind of camera obscure or something to trace the outlines, then they feel as though that artist is actually cheating. It's, it's not a way of thinking that I agree with with art. It's not, I don't think it's the best way to look at art. I prefer to look at art more in terms of the creative side and what the artist was trying to, to say about the world that he lived in or she lived in. But I guess we all have our own ways of um, looking at art. We know that this particular painting, they have studied it with x-rays and they find that Vermeer 
made a number of changes. In one of the original versions, there was a large map on the wall behind the kitchen mate, and he's removed that and replaced it just with a blank wall. Uh, I guess that's a, a compositional thing. If there was a map in the background, it sort of um, takes our view away a bit from this um, main figure. He also had in the, the bottom right of the painting and sort of overflowing laundry basket, which again he's replaced with this small uh, box sort of thing, which apparently is a foot warmer. Um, they were quite common in Holland at the time, or in the Netherlands, I should say. And it was a, a small wooden box with a perforated top and you could put hot embers into a, like a ceramic thing inside the box and the heat would rise up through the the holes, the perforations in the top of the box and you put your feet on top of it and it warmed your feet. But originally, as I say, it was a, an overflowing laundry basket. So again, artists did this and again, as I say, with oil paints, it was easier to maybe scrape off some of the paint and redo things, uh, paint over the top of things. If you're working with watercolour, it's less of an option. Okay, so the next artist then is the Japanese artist, uh, Hokusai. I include this because the sort of Japanese art, this, these sort of ukiyo-e um, woodblock prints, they were very popular during the time period that I'm most interested in, sort of from the, in the Impressionist through to, I guess, sort of the Fauvist period. As I say, many of the artists, including, for example, Vincent van Gogh, were fascinated by this Japanese art style. This artist, Hokusai, probably his most famous painting is the one on the top left that I've included, the Great Wave of Kanagawa. Kanagawa is sort of um, southwest of Tokyo. Um, well, back in those days, it was the city was called Edo, and it was just a small fishing village. Um, there was a period in Japanese history when there were lots of regional warlords and rulers and they were constantly fighting each other so one guy sort of rose up and defeated everybody else and so he became the shogun so they still had the emperor based in kyoto but this guy the shogun he was the real power in japan and he was the one with the big army basically he decided to move away from the traditional set, uh, capital of Japan in Kyoto and moved instead to this small fishing village called Edo, which was then renamed as Tokyo and became a, a massive city. It was also when Hokusai was around, it was kind of a a time of change. This period where the shoguns were in control was a kind of peaceful but uh, tightly controlled period of time in Japanese history. And as that started to come to an end, things started to become less certain. And some people say that the, the, painting, or the, the drawing of the wave is symbolic of this change from a peaceful, well-ordered society towards a society that was being more heavily influenced by outsiders. During the Shogun period, it was illegal and punishable by death to leave Japan or to enter Japan. So you couldn't, as a Japanese person, even you couldn't travel to say, uh, Korea and back again. If you did, you'd be executed. But if you look at the painting of the, the Great Wave, you can see, and it's not immediately obvious at first, but if you look, you can see three small boats. 
and these small boats are being sort of swallowed up by the huge wave. And also Mount Fuji is in the distance and it's dwarfed by this huge wave in the foreground. So some people have said it's a uh, Hokusai is making a comment on changes in society perhaps. But it's not, although it's probably his best known painting in the West, um, there's other paintings or prints by him that I prefer. So the main one that I put on the screen is a group of people, maybe merchants, moving along a small path. And it's a windy day. One guy had a, a backpack or something full of paper and it's all blowing away. Someone else's hat has been blown away. It's just, to me, it's a more humorous um, print. It's interesting. I like the, the shapes and the, I like the way he's captured the feeling of wind. You know, with drawing and painting, one of the weaknesses of drawing and painting is, well, there's maybe two. First of all, it's static. Uh, so it's, it can be difficult. And of course, there's no sound either. It's, it's silent and it's static. So it can be difficult sometimes to, to show the weather rain and wind because these things are moving they create sound and as visual artists we don't really have access to those things but i think in this case hokusai has captured the feeling of the wind the way the people are standing and moving the, the papers blowing away the hat blowing away i think he captures this idea of a, a really windy day very well he even has some leaves blowing off the trees As I say, the, this style of painting and drawing, this ukiyo-e, was very influential, especially for artists like um, Van Gogh. Vincent was, of course, influenced by Impressionism, and he certainly changed his color palette um, as a result of being exposed to Impressionist paintings. But it was probably ukiyo-e, this Japanese art form, that influenced him the most and a and number of letters that he wrote. He wrote hundreds of letters to his brother Teo, many of which survived. Um, and he did write in several of them about you know, looking at these Japanese uh, prints and he, he found them so, impress, print them so impressive. And they really were a strong influence on him. The next one, the next artist is uh, George Sura. So Sura was again a French artist. He's often associated with a short movement called Neo-Impressionism that existed towards the end of the Impressionist period and before sort of the post-Impressionist period really got going. And he developed this style of painting called pointillism or divisionism or neo-impressionism uh, has diff many different names. The painting doesn't interest me so much. His drawings though, uh, to me, when I first saw his drawings, I thought they were amazing. And they were so different to me because I was so used to seeing line drawings. The, the idea that you could draw in a way that didn't involve drawing lines was, I know it sounds silly, but it, to me it was a radical idea. It was something I'd never seen before. I just had it in my head that drawing meant drawing lines. And the idea you could create shapes with values was um, never really occurred to me until I saw Surah's drawings. So he used Conte Paso or Conte Crayon, if you like, and he used it on a, a textured paper, quite a rough paper. So that gives the sort of grainy nature of his drawings, which is also a part of his drawing style. And if you look at some of his earlier drawings, you can see where he did incorporate lines and then it slowly evolved and developed into this, um, this style that we can see on the screen.
Surau, again, unfortunately, is one of those artists who died young. Um, I can't remember exactly what he died of. It may have been an aneurysm or something like that. It was something that, it was very sudden. Um, and he was quite young. He was only in his early 30s, I think. So in that sense, of course, he's a bit like Van Gogh, who also died in his 30s. And also the next artist we're going to look at um, also died in his 30s. So this last artist is uh, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, and again, one of my favorite artists. Now, in some ways, again, this may seem like a strange choice because I do mostly landscapes and Toulouse-Lautrec did not like landscape painters. Um, he thought they were a bit crude and he basically didn't like that style of art. He saw a landscape or a cityscape as just a backdrop. Right? It added a bit of context for the figure. Toulouse-Lautrec was all about drawing the human figure. That's really all he cared about. But I love the way he sort of captures the time period and he captures sort of the moments within his paintings. Toulouse-Lautrec was no um, saint or a monk. He had a very, how should we put it, hedonistic lifestyle. Um, unfortunately, he did become an alcoholic. And this sort of lifestyle eventually led to, as I say, an early death. He had a stroke. Um, I think he was 32, 33, something like that. He wasn't very old. He had a, a, a serious stroke. He never recovered from it and he died S not so long after that. He also spent time again in a, an asylum. Um, but unlike Vincent, where it was sort of voluntary, Toulouse Lautrec's experience in the asylum was not so voluntary. I don't think he wanted to go there. I think it was his family that put him into the asylum. It was his art. It was Toulouse Lautrec's art that got him back out of the asylum because he started painting and drawing these um, circus scenes mainly in the hope that he could convince the doctors that he was sane. And the doctors were, I guess, so impressed with his drawings and his skill as a, a, an artist that they decided he was sane and so they released him. Again, this asylum that Henri went to, it was not, you were not encouraged to leave the asylum or to walk around in gardens. It was, there were bars on the windows, it was a prison, basically. But as I say, fortunately, he did have some art supplies and he was able to convince the doctors that he was sane. He left the asylum, but as I say, he had a stroke not that long afterwards. But in his short time, he did, he was a, a very impressive artist. He is also sometimes most remembered for his posters. He did about 20 or 30 posters and he sort of combined before that, before Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, advertising posters were basically just text. And there may have been a few small images, but a lot of it was text. Henri basically invented graphic design. He, he redesigned or he redeveloped the whole concept of a poster and he made it into a kind of art form. Sometimes I heard a story that his posters became so popular that it was actually a problem for the, the people who commissioned them because they would commission a poster, Henri would create, uh, create the poster and once everybody was happy with it, it would be printed and then those prints would be um, glued onto fences and walls and things like that. But because they were so popular, people would run around at night uh, stealing the posters and collecting them and putting them up in their own rooms, in their own houses. 
I don't know if it's true, but it's one of the stories around toulouse lautrec But I do, I'm a huge fan of his style of posters and generally his artwork, including his drawings as well. He was around at the same time as Vincent van Gogh, Emile Benoit and a bunch of other post-impressionist artists. And it was from a time when it was the early days of Vincent van Gogh's art career. Uh, and he was in Paris and he was going around some of those different schools and ateliers and that type of thing. And that's where they all sort of met each other and they spent a bit of time together. And I think for the most part, they were friends and they remained friends. I don't know if Vincent corresponded much with Toulouse-Lautrec. He did certainly keep his friendship with uh, Bernard and other people. But I'm sure they had at least some influence on each other. Okay, well, as I say, different video this week. Um, I hope it was of some interest. Um, certainly, I find all of these artists fascinating and the story behind the artists and their artwork to be fascinating. And it's definitely something I recommend doing is just spending a bit of time researching some of your favorite artists and your favorite artworks. And you know, learning from them and trying to incorporate some of the ideas into your own um, artwork. Okay, we've made it this far in the video. Uh, thank you for watching and listening and hopefully see you in next week's video.